Far out in the wide sea, where the water is blue as the loveliest cornflower and clear as the purest crystal, where it's so deep that very, very many church towers must be heaped one upon another in order to reach from the lowest depth to the surface above, dwell the mer people. Now, you must not imagine that there's nothing but sand below the water. No, indeed, far from it. Trees and plants of wondrous beauty grow there, whose stems and leaves are so light that they're waved to and fro by the slightest motion of the water, almost as if they have living beings. Almost as if they were living beings. Fishes, great and small, glide in and out among the branches, just as birds fly about among our trees. Where the water is deepest stands the palace of the Merking. The walls of this palace are of coral, and the high pointed windows are of amber. The roof, however, is composed of mussel shells, which, as the billows pass over them, are continually opening and shutting. This looks exceedingly pretty, especially as each of these mussel shells contains a number of bright, glittering pearls, one only of which would be the most costly ornament in the diadem of a king in the upper world. The Mer King, who lived in this palace, had been for many years a widower. His old mother managed the household affairs for him. She was on the whole a sensible sort of lady, although extremely proud of her high birth and station, on which account she wore twelve oysters on her tail, whilst the other inhabitants of the sea, even those of distinction, were allowed only six. In every other respect, she merited unlimited praise, especially for the affection she showed to the six little princesses, her granddaughters. These were all very beautiful children. The youngest was, however, the most lovely. Her skin was as soft and delicate as a rose leaf. Her eyes were of a deep... Her, eye, uh, her eyes were of as deep a blue as the sea. But like all other mermaids, she had no feet. Her body ended in a tail, that of a fish. The whole day long, the children used to play in the spacious apartments of the palace, where beautiful flowers grew out of the walls on all sides around them. When the great amber windows were open, fishes would swim into these apartments as swallows fly into our rooms. But the fishes were bolder than the swallows. They swam straight up to the little princesses, ate from their hands, and allowed themselves to be caressed. In front of the palace there was a large garden, full of fiery red and dark blue trees, whose fruit glittered like gold, and whose flowers resembled a bright burning sun. The sand that formed the soil of the garden was of a bright blue colour, something like flames of sulphur, and a strangely beautiful blue was spread over the whole, so that one might have fancied oneself raised very high in the air, with the sky at once above and below, certainly not at the bottom of the sea. When the waters were quite still, the sun might be seen looking like a purple flower, out of whose cup streamed forth the light of the world. Each of the little princesses had her own plot in the garden, where she might plant and sow at her pleasure. One chose hers to be made in the shape of a whale, another preferred the figure of a mermaid. But the youngest had hers quite round like the sun, and planted it. Planted in it only the flowers that were red as the sun seemed to her. She was certainly a singular child, very quiet and thoughtful, whilst her sisters were adorning themselves with all sorts of gay things that came out of a ship which had been wrecked. She asked for nothing 
but a beautiful white marble statue of a boy which had been found in it. She put the statue in her garden and planted a red weeping willow by its side. The tree grew up quickly and let its long boughs fall upon the bright blue ground, where ever moving shadows playing in violet hues, as if boughs and roots were embracing. Nothing pleased the little princess more than to hear about the world of human beings living above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her everything she knew about ships, towns, men, and land animals, and was particularly pleased when she heard that the flowers of the upper world had a pleasant fragrance, for the flowers of the sea are scentless, and that the world and that the woods were green, and the fishes fluttering among the branches of various gay colours, and that they could sing with a loud, clear voice. The old lady meant birds, but she called them fishes, because her grandchildren, having never seen a bird, would not otherwise have understood her. When you've attained your fifteenth year, added she, you'll be permitted to rise to the surface of the sea, You'll then sit by moonlight in the cliffs of the rocks, see the ships sail by, and learn to distinguish towns and men. The next year the eldest of the sisters reached this happy age, but the others, alas, the second sister was a year younger than the eldest, the third a year younger than the second, and so on. The youngest had still five whole years to wait till the joyful time should come when she might rise to the surface of the water and see what was going on in the upper world. However, the eldest promised to tell the others of everything she might see when the first day of her being of age arrived, for the grandmother gave them but little information, and there was so much that they wished to hear. But none of the sisters longed as ardently for the day when she should be released from childish restraint as the youngest. She was she who had longed to wait and was so quiet and thoughtful. Many a night she stood by the open window, looking up through the clear blue water, whilst the fishes were leaping and playing around her. She could see the sun and the moon, their light was pale, but they appeared larger than they do to those who live in the upper world. If a shadow passed over them, she knew it must be either a whale or a ship sailing by, sailing by full of human beings, who indeed little thought that far beneath them a little mermaid was passionately stretching forth her white hands towards their ship's keel. The day had now arrived when the eldest princess had attained her fifteenth year and was therefore allowed to rise up to the surface of the sea. When she returned, she had a thousand things to relate. Her chief pleasure had been to sit upon a sandbank in the moonlight, looking at the large town which lay on the coast where lights were beaming like stars, where music was playing. She had heard the distant noise of men and carriages. She had seen the high church towers, had listened to the ringing of the bells, and just because she could not go there, she longed the more after all these things. How attentively did her youngest sister listen to her words! And when she next stood at night-time by her open window, gazing upward through the blue waters, she thought so intensely of the great noisy city that she fancied she could hear the church bells ringing. Next year the second sister received permission to swim wherever she pleased. She rose to the surface of the sea just when the sun was setting. And this sight so delighted her that she declared it to be the most beautiful than anything else she had ever seen above the waters. The whole sky seemed tinged with gold, she said, and it's, it is impossible for me to describe to you the beauty of the clouds. Now red, 
now violet, they glided over me, but still more swiftly flew over the water a flock of white swans, just where the sun was descending. I looked after them, but the sun disappeared, and the bright, rosy light on the surface of the sea and on the edges of the clouds was gradually extinguished. It was now time for the third sister to visit the upper world. She was the boldest of the six. She ventured up a river. On its shores she saw green hills covered with woods and vineyards, from among which arose houses and castles. She heard the birds singing, and the sun shone with so much power that she was continually obliged to plunge below in order to cool her burning face. In a little bay she met with a number of children who were bathing and jumping about. She would have joined in their gambles, but the children fled back to land in great terror, and a little black animal barked at her in such a manner that she herself was frightened at last and swam back to the sea. She could not, however, forget the green woods, the verdant hills, and the pretty children, who, although they had no fins, were swimming about in the water as fearlessly. The fourth sister was not so bold. She remained in the open sea, and said on her return home she thought nothing could be more beautiful. She had seen ships sailing by, so far off that they looked like seagulls. She had watched the merry dolphins gambling in the water, and the enormous whales sending up into the air a thousand sparkling fountains. The year after, the fifth sister attained her fifteenth year. Her birthday happened at a different season to that of her sisters. It was winter, the sea was of a green colour, and immense icebergs were floating on its surface. These, she said, looked like pearls. They were, however, much larger than the church towers in the land of human beings. She sat down upon one of the pearls, and let the wind play with her long hair. But then all the ships hoisted their sails in terror, and escaped as quickly as possible. In the evening the sea was covered with sails, and whilst the great mountains of ice alternately sank and rose again, and beamed with a reddish glow, flashes of lightning burst forth from the clouds, and the thunder rolled on, peal after peal. The sails of all the ships were instantly furled, and horror and affright reigned on board. But the princess sat still on the iceberg, looking unconcernedly with, at the blue zigzag of the flashes. The first time that either of these sisters rose out of the sea, she was quite enchanted at the sight of so many new and beautiful objects. But the novelty was soon over, and it was not long ere they Oh, oh, uh, their own home appeared more attractive than the upper world, for there only did they find everything agreeable. Many an evening would the five sisters rise hand in hand from the depths of the ocean. Their voices were far sweeter than any human voice, and when a storm was coming on, they would swim in front of the ships and sing, Oh, how sweetly did they sing, describing the happiness of those who lived at the bottom of the sea, and entreating the sailors not to be afraid, but to come down to them. The mariners, however, did not understand their words. They fancied the song was only the whistling of the wind, and thus they lost the hidden glories of the sea. For if their ships were wrecked, all on board were drowned, and none but dead men ever entered the Merking's palace. Whilst the sisters were swimming at evening time, the youngest would remain motionless and alone. 
in her father's palace, looking up after them. She would have wept, but mermaids cannot weep, and therefore, when they are troubled, suffer infinitely more than human beings do. Oh, if I were but fifteen, sighed she, I know that I should love the upper world and its inhabitants so much. At last the time she had so longed for arrived. Well, now it's your turn said the grandmother. Come here that I may adorn you like your sisters. And she wound around her hair a wreath of white lilies, where every petal was the half of a pearl, and then commanded each large oyster to fasten themselves to the princess's tail, in token of her high rank. But that's so very uncomfortable, said the little princess. One must not mind slight inconveniences when one wishes to look well, said the old lady. How willingly would the princess have given up all this splendour and exchanged her heavy crown for the red flowers of her garden, which was so much more becoming of her. But she dared not to do so. Farewell, she said, and she rose from the sea, light as a flake of foam, when for the first time in her life she appeared on the surface of the water. The sun had just sunk below the horizon. The clouds were beaming with bright golden and rosy hues. The evening star was shining in the pale western sky. The air was mild and refreshing, and the sea as smooth as a looking-glass. A large ship with three masts lay on the still waters. One sail only was unfurled, but not a breath was stirring, and the sailors were quietly seated on the cordage and ladders of the vessel. Music and song resounded from the deck, and after it grew dark, hundreds of lamps all of a sudden burst forth into light whilst innumerable flags were fluttering overhead. The little mermaid swam close up to the captain's cabin, and every now and then, when the ship was raised by the motion of the water, she could look through the clear window panes. She saw within many richly dressed men. The handsomest among them was a young prince with large black eyes, he could not certainly be more than sixteen years old, and it was in honour of his birthday that a grand festival was being celebrated. The crew were dancing on the decks, and when the young prince appeared among them, a hundred rockets went up into the sky, turning night into day, and so terrifying the little mermaid that for some minutes she plunged beneath the water, However, she soon raised her little head again, and then it seemed as if all the stars were falling down upon her. Such a fiery shower she had never seen before. Never had she heard that men possessed such wonderful powers. Large suns revolved around her, bright flashes swam in the air, and everything was reflected perfectly on the clear surface of the sea. It was so light in the ship that everything could be seen distinctly. Oh, how happy the young prince was! He shook hands with the sailors, laughed and jested with them, whilst sweet notes of music mingled with the silence of night. It was now late, but the little mermaid could not tear herself away from the ship and the handsome young prince. She remained looking through the cabin window, rocked to and fro by the waves. There was a foaming and a fermentation in the depths beneath, and the ship began to move on faster. The sails were spread, the waves rose high, thick clouds gathered over the sky, and the noise of distant thunder was heard. The sailors perceived that a storm was coming on, 
so they again furled the sails. The great vessel was tossed about on the tempestuous ocean like a light boat, and the waves rose to an immense height, towering over the ship, which alternately sank beneath and rose above them. To the little mermaid this seemed most delightful, but the ship's crew thought very differently. The vessel cracked, the stout masts bent under the violence of the bellows. The waters rushed in. For a minute the ship tottered to and fro, and then the main mast broke as if it had been a reed. The ship turned over and was filled with water. The little mermaid now perceived that the crew was in danger, for she herself was forced to beware of the beams and splinters torn from the vessel and floating about on the waves. But at the same time it became pitch dark, so that she could not distinguish anything. Presently, however, a dreadful flash of lightning disclosed to her the whole of the wreck. Her eyes sought the young prince. The same instant the ship sank to the bottom, at first she was delighted, thinking that the prince must now come to her abode. But she soon remembered that man cannot live in water, and that therefore if the prince ever entered her palace, it would be as a corpse. Die? No, he must not die. She swam through the fragments with which the water was strewn, regardless of the dangers she was incurring, and at last found the prince all but exhausted and with great difficulty keeping his head above water. He had already closed his eyes, and must inevitably have been drowned, had not the little mermaid come to his rescue. She seized hold of him and kept him above the water, suffering the current to bear them on together. Towards morning the storm was hushed, no trace, however, remained of the ship. The sun rose like fire out of the sea. His beams seemed to restore colour to the prince's cheeks, but his eyes were still closed. The mermaid kissed his high forehead and stroked his wet hair away from his face. He looked like the marble statue in her garden. She kissed him again and wished most fervently that he might recover. She now saw the dry land with its mountains glittering with snow. A green wood extended along the coast, and at the entrance of the wood stood a chapel or convent. She could not be sure which. Citron, citron and lemon trees grew in the garden adjoining it, an avenue of tall palm trees led up to the door. The sea here formed a little bay in which the water was quite smooth but very deep, and under the cliffs there were dry, firm sands. Hither swam the little mermaid with the seemingly dead prince. She laid him upon the warm sand and took care to place his head high and to turn his face to the sun. The bells began to ring in the large white building which stood before her, and a number of young girls came out to walk in the garden. The mermaid went away from the shore, hid herself behind some stones, covered her head with foam so that her little face could not be seen, and watched, uh, and watched the prince with unremitting attention. It was not long before one of the young girls approached. She seemed quite frightened at finding the prince in this state, apparently dead. Soon, however, she recovered herself and ran back to call her sisters. The little mermaid saw that the prince revived, and that all around smiled kindly and joyfully upon him. For her, however, he looked not for, for her, however, he looked not. He knew not that it was she who had saved him. And when the prince was taken into the home, she felt so sad that she immediately plunged beneath the water and returned to her father's palace. 
If she had been before quiet and thoughtful, she now grew still more so. Her sisters asked her what she had seen in the upper world, but she made no answer. Many an evening she rose to the palace. Uh, many an evening she rose to the place where she'd left the prince. She saw the snow on the mountains melt, the fruits in the garden ripen and gathered, but the prince she never saw, so she always returned sorrowful to her subterranean abode. Her only pleasure was to sit in her little garden, gazing on the beautiful statue, so like the, so like the prince. She cared no longer for her flowers. They grew up in wild luxuriance, covered the steps, and entwined their long stems and tendrils among the boughs of the trees, so that her whole garden became a bower. At last, being unable to conceal her sorrow any longer, she revealed the secret to one of her sisters, who told it to the other princesses, and they to some of their friends. Among them was a young mermaid, who recalled the prince, having been an eyewitness herself to the festivities in the ship. She knew also in what country the prince lived, and the name of its king. Come, little sister, said the princesses, and, embrace, and embracing her, they rose together arm in arm out of the water, just in front of the prince's palace. This palace was built of bright yellow stones. A flight of white marble steps led from it down to the sea. A gilded cupola crowned the building, and white marble figures, which might almost have been taken for real men and women, were placed among the pillars surrounding it. Through the clear glass of the high windows, one might look into magnificent apartments, hung with silken curtains, the walls adorned with magnificent paintings. It was a real treat to the little royal mermaids to behold so splendid an abode. They gazed through the windows of one of the largest rooms, and in the centre saw a fountain playing, whose waters sprang up so high as to reach the glittering cupola above, through which the sunbeams fell dancing on the water and brightening the pretty plants which grew around it. The little mermaid now knew where her beloved prince dwelt, and henceforth she went there almost every evening. She often approached nearer the land than her sisters had ventured, and even swam up the narrow channel that flowed under the marble balcony. Here, on a bright moonlit night, she would watch the young prince who believed himself alone. Sometimes she saw him sailing on the water in a galley painted in a in a gaily painted boat with many coloured flags waving above. She would then hide among the green reeds which grew on the banks, listening to his voice, and if anyone in the boat noticed the rustling of her long silver veil, which was caught now and then by the light breeze, they only fancied it was a swan flapping his wings. Many a night when the fishermen were casting their nets by the beacon's light. She heard them talking of the prince and relating the noble actions he had performed. She was then so happy, thinking how she had saved his life when struggling with the waves and remembering how his head had rested on her bosom and how she had kissed him when he knew nothing of it and could never even dream of such a thing. Human beings became more and more dear to her every day. She wished that she were one of them. Their world seemed to her much larger than that of the Mer people. They could fly over the ocean in their ships, as well as climb to the summits of those high mountains that rose above the clouds. And their wounded domains extended 
much fur their wooded domains extended much further than the mermaid's eyes could penetrate. There were many things that she wished to hear explained, but her sisters could not give her any satisfactory answers. She was again obliged to have recourse to the old queen mother, who knew a great deal about the upper world, which she used to call the country above the sea. Do men, when they're not drowned, live forever? She asked one day. Do they not die as we do, who live at the bottom of the sea? Yes, was the grandmother's reply. They must die like us, and their life is much shorter than ours. We live to the age of three hundred years. But when we die, we become foam of the sea, and are not allowed even to share a grave among those that are dear to us. We have no mortal souls. We can never live again, and are like the grass, which, once cut down, is withered forever. Human beings, on the contrary, have souls that continue to live, when their bodies become dust, and as we rise out of the water to admire the abode of man, they ascend to glorious unknown dwellings in the sky, which are not permit we are not permitted to see. Why have not we immortal souls? asked the little mermaid. I would willingly give up my three hundred years to be a human being for only one day thus to become entitled to that heavenly world above. You must not think like that, answered the grandmother. It is much better as it is. We live longer and are far happier than human beings. So I must die and be dashed like foam over the sea, never to rise again and hear the gentle murmur of the ocean, never again to see the beautiful flowers and the bright sun. Tell me, dear grandmother, are there no means by which I may obtain an immortal soul? No, replied the old lady. It is true that if thou could win the affections of a human being as to become dearer to him than either father or mother, if he loved thee with all his heart and promised whilst the priest joined his hand with thine to be always faithful to thee, then his soul would flow into thine, and thou wast then become partaker of human bliss. But that can never be, for what is our eyes is the most beautiful part of our body. The tail, the inhabitants of the earth, think hideous. They cannot bear it. To appear handsome to them, the body must have two clumsy props which they call legs. The little mermaid sighed and looked mournfully at the seely part of her form, otherwise so fair and delicate. We are happy, added the old lady. We shall jump and swim about merrily for three hundred years. That's a long time, and afterwards we shall repose peacefully in death. This evening we have a court ball. The ball which the Queen Mother spoke of was far more splendid than anything that has ever been seen on earth. The walls of the saloon were of crystal, very thick but yet very clear. Hundreds of large mussel shells were planted in rows along them. These shells were some of rose colour, some green as grass, but all sending forth a bright light which not only illuminated the whole apartment, but also shone through the glassy walls so as to light up the waters around for a great space and making the scales of the numberless fishes, great and small, crimson and purple, silver and gold-coloured, appear more brilliant than ever. Through the centre of the salon flowed a bright, clear stream, on the surface of which danced mermen and mermaids to the melodies of their own sweet voices, voices far sweeter than those of the dwellers upon earth. The little princess sang more harmoniously than any other, and they clapped their hands and applauded her. 
She was pleased at this, for she knew well that there was neither on earth nor in the sea a more beautiful voice than hers. But her thoughts soon returned to the world above. She could not forget the handsome prince. She could not control her sorrow at not having an immortal soul. She stole away from her father's palace, and whilst all was joy within, she sat alone, lost in thought, in her little neglected garden. On a, on a sudden, she heard the tones of horns resounding over the water far away in the distance, and she said to herself, Now he is going out to hunt. He whom I love more than my father and my mother, with whom my thoughts are constantly occupied, and to whom I would so willingly trust the happiness of my life. All I, all, all I will, uh, all, all will I risk to win him. And an immortal soul, whilst my sisters are still dancing in the palace, I'll go to the enchantress whom I have hitherto feared so much, but who is nevertheless the only person who can advise and help me. So the little mermaid left the garden and went to the foaming whirlpool beyond, which dwelt the enchantress. She had never been this way before. Neither flowers nor sea grass bloomed along her path. She had to traverse an extent of bare grey sand till she reached the whirlpool, whose waves were eddying and whizzing like mill wheels, tearing everything they could seize along with them into the abyss below. She was obliged to make her way through this horrible place in order to arrive at the territory of the Enchantress. Then she had to pass through a boiling, slimy bog, which the Enchantress called her turf mirror, her turf moor. Her house stood in a wood beyond this, and a strange abode it was. All the trees and bushes around were polypi, looking like hundred-headed serpents shooting up out of the ground. Their branches were long, slimy arms with fingers of worms, every member from the root to the uttermost tip ceaselessly moving and extending on all sides. Whatever they seized, they fastened upon so that it could not loosen itself from their grasp. The little mermaid stood for a minute, looking at this horrible wood. Her heart beat with fear, and she would certainly have returned without attaining her object had she not remembered the prince and immortality. The thought gave her new courage. She bound up her long, waving hair, that the poly polypi might not catch hold of it, crossing her delicate arms over her bosoms. And swifter than a fish can glide through the water, she passed these unseemly trees, who stretched their eager arms after her in vain. She could not, however, help seeing that every polypus had something in its grasp, held as firmly by a thousand little arms, as if enclosed by iron bands. The whitened skeletons of a number of human beings who had been drowned in the sea and had sunk into the abyss grinned horribly from the arms of these polypi. Helms, chests, skeletons of land animals were also held in their embrace. Among other things might be seen even a little mermaid whom they had seized and strangled. What a fearful sight for the unfortunate princess. But she got safely through this wood of horrors and then arrived at a slimy place where immense fat snails were crawling about and in the midst of their palace stood a house built of bones of the unfortunate people who'd been shipwrecked. Here sat the witch caressing a toad in the same manner as some person would pet birds. The ugly fat snail she called her chickens 
and she permitted them to crawl about her. I know well what you would ask of me, she said to the little princess. Your wish is foolish enough, yet it shall be fulfilled, though its accomplishment is sure to bring misfortune on you, my fairest princess. You wish to get rid of your tail and to be instead two stilts like those of human beings, in order that a young prince may fall in love with you, and that you may obtain an immortal soul. It is not so. Whilst the witch spoke these words, she laughed so violently that her pet toad and snails fell from her lap. You come just at the right time, continued she. Had you come after sunset, it would not have been in my power to have helped you before another year. I will prepare for you a drink with which you must swim to land. You must sit down upon the shore and swallow it, and then your tail will fall and shrink up to the things which men call legs. This transformation will, however, be very painful. You'll feel as though a sharp knife passed through your body. All who look on you after you've been changed will say that you are the loveliest child of earth they've ever seen. You'll retain your peculiar undulating movements, and no dancer will move so lightly, but every step you take will cause you pain, all but unbearable. It will seem to you as though you were walking on the sharpest edges of swords, and your blood will flow. Can you endure all this suffering? If so, I'll grant you your request. Yes, I will, answered the princess, with a faltering voice, for she remembered her dear prince, and the immortal soul which her suffering might win. Only consider, said the witch, that you can never again become a mermaid, when once you have received a human form. You may never return to your sisters and your father's palace, and unless you shall win the prince's love to such a degree that he shall leave father and mother for you, that you shall be mixed up with all his thoughts and wishes, and unless the priest joins your hands so that you become man and wife, you will never obtain the immortality you seek. The morrow of the day on which he is united to another will see your death, your heart will break with sorrow, and you will be changed to foam on the sea. Still I will venture, said the little mermaid, pale and trembling as a dying person. Besides all this, I must be paid and it is no slight thing that I require for my troubles. Thou hast the sweetest voice of all the dwellers of the sea, and thou thinkest by, by its means to charm the prince. This voice, however, I demand as my recompense. The best thing thou possessed I require in exchange for the magic drink. For I shall be obliged to sacrifice my own blood in order to give it, the sharp sharpness of a two-edged sword. But if you take my voice from me, said the princess, what have I left with which to charm the prince? The graceful form, replied the witch, thy modest gait and speaking eyes. With such as these, it will be easy to infatuate a vain human heart. Well, now hast thou lost courage? Put out thy little tongue, that I may cut it off, and take it for myself, in return, for my magic drink. Be it so, said the princess, and the witch, the witch took up her cauldron, in order to mix her potion. Cleanliness is a good thing, remarked she, as she began to rub the cauldron with a handful of toads and snails. She then scratched her bosom and let the black blood trickle down into the cauldron. Every moment, throwing in new ingredients, the smoke 
from the mixture assuming such horrible forms as were enough to fill beholders with terror, and a moaning and a groaning proceeding from it, which might be compared to the weeping of crocodiles. The magic drink at length became clear and transparent as pure water. It was ready. Here it is, said the witch to the princess, cutting out her tongue at the same moment. The poor little mermaid was now dumb. She could neither sing nor speak. If the polypi should attempt to seize you as you pass through my little grove, said the witch, you have only to sprinkle some of this magic drink over them, and their arms will burst into a thousand pieces. But the princess had no need of this counsel. For the polypi drew hastily back as soon as they perceived the bright vial that glittered in her hand like a star. Thus she passed safely through the formidable wood over the moor and across the foaming mill stream. She now looked once again at her father's palace. The lamps in the salon were extinguished and all the family were asleep. She would not go in, for she could not speak if she did. She was about to leave her home for ever. Her heart was ready to break with sorrow at the thought. She stole into the garden, plucked a flower from the bed of each of her sisters as, she, as a remembrance, kissed her hand again and again, and then rose through the dark blue waters to the world above. The sun had not yet risen when she arrived at the prince's dwelling and ascended those well-known marble steps. The moon still shone in the sky when the little mermaid drank off the wonderful liquid contained in her vial. She felt it run through her like a sharp knife and she fell down in a swoon. When the sun rose, she awoke she felt a burning pain in all her limbs. But she saw, standing close to her, the object of her love, the handsome young prince, whose coal black eyes were fixed inquiringly upon her. Full of shame, she cast down her own and perceived instead of the long fish-like tail she had hitherto borne, two slender legs. But she was quite naked, and tried in vain to cover herself with her long, thick hair. The prince asked who she was and how she got there, and she in reply smiled and gazed upon him with her bright blue eyes, for alas, she could not speak. He then led her by the hand into the palace. She found that the witch had told her true. She felt as though she were walking on the edges of sharp swords, but she bore the pain willingly. On she passed, light as a zephyr, and all who saw her wondered at her light undulating movements. When she entered the palace, rich clothes of muslin and silk were brought to her. She was lovelier than all who dwelt there but she could neither speak nor sing. Some female slaves, gaily dressed in silk and gold, sang before the prince and his royal parents, and one of them distinguished herself by her clear, sweet voice, which the prince applauded by clapping his hands. This made the little mermaid very sad, for she knew that she used to sing far better than that young slave. Alas, thought she, if he did but know that for his sake I have given away my voice forever. The slaves began to dance. A lovely little mermaidian then arose, stretched out her delicate white arms, and hovered gracefully about the room. Every motion displayed more and more the perfect symmetry and elegance of her figure, and the expression which beamed in her speaking eyes, touched the hearts of the spectators far more than the song of the slaves. All present were enchanted, but especially the young prince, who called her 
his dear little foundling. And she danced again and again, although every step cost her excessive pain. The prince then said she should always be with him. And accordingly, a sleeping place was prepared for her on velvet cushions in the anterior room of her own apartment. The prince caused a suit of male apparel to be made for her in order that she might accompany him in his rides. So together they traversed the fragrant woods where green boughs brushed against the shoulders and the birds sang merrily among the fresh leaves. With him she climbed up steep mountains and although her tender feet bled so as to be remarked by the attendants, she only smiled and followed her dear prince to the heights whence they could see the clouds chasing each other beneath them, like a flock of birds migrating to other countries. During the night she would, when all in the palace were at rest, walk down the marble steps in order to cool her feet in the deep waters. She would then think of those beloved ones who dwelt in the lower world. One night, as she was thus bathing her feet, her sisters swam together to the spot arm in arm and singing but alas so mournfully she beckoned to them and they immediately recognized her and told her how great was the mourning in her father's house for her loss from this time the sisters visited her every night and once they brought with them the old grandmother who had not seen the upper world for a great many years they likewise bought their father, the Merking, with his crown on his head. But these two old people did not venture near enough to the land to be able to speak to her. The little mermaiden became dearer and dearer to the prince every day, but he only looked upon her as a sweet, gentle child, and the thought of making her his wife never entered his head. And yet, his wife she must be, ere she could receive an immortal soul. His wife she must be, or she would change into foam and be driven restlessly over the billows of the sea. Dost thou not love me above all others? Her eyes seemed to ask as she pressed her fondly in his arms and kissed her lovely brow. Yes, the prince would say. Thou art dearer to me than any other, for no one is as good as art thou, as thou art. Thou loveliest me so much, and thou art so like a young maiden, whom I have seen but once, and may never see again. I was on board a ship which was wrecked by a sudden tempest. The waves threw me on the shore, near a holy temple, where a number of young girls are occupied constantly with religious services. The youngest of them found me on the shore and saved my life. I saw her only once, but her image is vividly impressed upon my memory, and her alone can I love. But she belongs to the holy temple, and thou who resemblest her so much has been given to me for consolation. Never will we be parted. Alas, he does not know that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaiden, sighing deeply. I bore him over the wild waves into the wooded bay, where the holy temple stood. I sat behind the rocks, waiting till someone should come. I saw the pretty maiden approach, whom he loves more than me. And again she heaved a deep sigh, for she could not weep. He said that the young girl belongs to the holy temple. She never comes out into the world, so they cannot meet each other again. And I'm always with him, see him daily. I'll love him and devote my whole life to him. So the prince is going to be married to the beautiful daughter of the neighbouring king, said the courtiers.
That is why he's having that splendid ship fitted out. It is announced that he wishes to travel, but in reality he goes to see the princess. A numerous retinue will accompany him. The little mermaiden smiled at these and similar conjectures, for she knew the prince's intentions better than anyone else. I must go, he said to her. I must see the beautiful princess. My parents require me to do so, but they'll not compel me to marry her and bring her home as my bride. And it is quite impossible for me to love her, for she cannot be so like that beautiful girl in the temple as thou art. And if I were obliged to choose, I should prefer thee, my little silent fondling, with the speaking eyes, and he kissed her rosy lips, played with her locks, and folded her in his arms, whereupon arose in her heart a sweet vision of human happiness and immortal bliss. Thou art not afraid of the sea, art thou, my sweet silent child? asked he tenderly, as they stood together in the splendid ship, which was to take them to the country of the neighbouring king. And then he told her of the storms that sometimes agitate the waters, of the strange fish that inhabit the deep, and the wonderful things seen by divers. But she smiled at his words, for she knew better than any child of earth what went on in the depths of the ocean. At night time, when the moon shone brightly, and when all on board were fast asleep, she sat in the ship's galley, looked down into the sea, it seemed to her, as she gazed through the foamy track made by the ship's keel, that she saw her father's palace and her grandmother's silver crown. She then saw her sisters rise out of the water, looking sorrowful and stretching out their hands towards her. She nodded to them, smiled, and would have explained that everything was going to be going on quite according to her wishes. But just then, the cabin boy approached, upon which the sisters plunged beneath the water so suddenly that the boy thought what he had seen on the waves was nothing but foam. The next morning the ship entered the harbour of the king's splendid capital. Bells were rung, trumpets sounded, and soldiers marched in procession through the city with waving banners and glittering bayonets. Every day witnessed some new entertainments. Bulls and parties followed each other. The princess, however, was not yet in town. She'd been sent to a distant convent for education and had there been taught the practice of all royal virtues. At last she arrived at the palace. The little mermaid had been anxious to see this unparalleled princess and she was now obliged to confess that she had never before seen so beautiful a creature. The skin of the princess was so white and delicate that the veins might be seen through it, and her dark eyes sparkled beneath a pair of finely formed eyebrows. It is herself, exclaimed the prince, when they met. It is she who saved my life when I lay like a corpse on the seashore. And he pressed his blushing bride to his beating heart. Oh, I'm all too happy, said he to the dumb foundling. Whilst I never dared to hope for what I'd never dared to hope for has come to pass. Thou must rejoice in the happiness, for thou lovest me more than all others who surround me and the little mermaid kissed his hand in silent sorrow. It seemed to her as if her heart was breaking already, although the morrow of his marriage day, which must inevitably see her death, had not yet dawned. Again rung the church bells, whilst heralds rode through the streets of the capital to announce the approaching bride Odorous flames burned in silver candlesticks on all the altars. The priests 
swung their golden incense, and bride and bridegrooms joined hands whilst the holy words that united them were spoken. The little mermaid, clad in silk and cloth of gold, stood behind the princess and held the train of the bridal dress. But her ears heard nothing of the solemn music. Her eyes saw not the holy ceremony. She remembered her approaching end. She remembered that she had lost both this world and the next. That very same evening, bride and bridegroom went on board the ship. Cannons were fired, flags were waved with the breeze, and the centre of the deck stood a magnificent pavilion of purple and cloth of gold, fitted up with the richest and softest couches. Here the princely pair were to spend the night. A favourable wind swelled the sails, and the ship glided lightly over the blue waters. As soon as it was dark, coloured lamps were hung out, and dancing began on the deck. The little mermaid was thus involuntarily reminded of what she had seen the first time she rose to the upper world. The spectacle that now presented itself was equally splendid, and she was obliged to join in the dance, hovering lightly as a bird over the ship's boards. All applauded her, for never had she danced with more enchanting grace. Her little feet suffered extremely, but she no longer felt the pain, the anguish. Her heart suffered was much greater. It was the last evening she might see him, for whose sake she had forsaken her home and all her family, had given away her beautiful voice, and suffered daily the most violent pain, all without his having the least suspicion of it. It was the last evening that she might breathe the same atmosphere in which he, the beloved one, lived. The last evening when she might behold the deep blue sea and the starry heavens, an eternal night, in which she might neither think nor dream, awaited her, and all the joy in the ship, and she, her heart, filled with thoughts of death, and annihilation, smiled and danced with the others till past midnight. Then the prince kissed his lovely bride, and arm in arm they entered the magnificent tent prepared for the repose. All was now still. The steerman alone stood at the ship's helm. The little mermaid leaned her white arms on the gallery, and looked towards the east, watching for the dawn, she well knew that the first sunbeam would witness her dissolution. She saw her sisters rise out of the sea. Deadly pale were their features, and their long hair no more fluttered over their shoulders. It had all been cut off. We have given it to the witch, said they, to induce her to help thee, so that thou mayest not die. She had given to us a penknife. Here it is. Before the sun rises, thou must plunge it into the prince's heart, and when his warm blood trickles down upon thy feet, they will again be changed to a fish-like tail. Thou will once more become a mermaid, and will live thy full three hundred years. Ere thou changest to foam on the sea. But hasten, Either lie, or thou must die before sunrise. Either he, or thou must die before sunrise. Our aged mother mourns for thee, so much her grey hair has fallen off through sorrow, as ours fell before the scissors of the witch. Kill the prince and come down to us. Hasten, hasten, dost thou not see the red streaks on the eastern sky? announcing the near approach of the sun. A few minutes more, and he rises, and then all will be over with thee. At these words they sighed deeply and vanished. The little mermaid drew aside the purple curtain of the pavilion, where lay the bride and bridegroom. 
bending over them, she kissed the prince's forehead, and then glancing at the sky, she saw that the dawning light became every moment brighter. The prince's lips unconsciously murmured, murmured the name of his bride. He was dreaming of her, and her only, whilst the fatal penknife trembled in the hand of the unhappy mermaid. All at once she threw far out into the sea that instrument of death. The waves rose like bright blazing flames around, and the water where it fell seemed tinged with blood. With eyes fast becoming dim and fixed, she looked once more at her beloved prince, then plunged from the ship into the sea and felt her body slowly but surely dissolving into foam. The sun rose from his watery bed. His beams fell so softly and warmly upon her that our little mermaid was scarcely sensible of dying. She still saw the glorious sun, and over her head hovered a thousand beautiful transparent foam forms. She could still distinguish the white sails of the ship and the bright red clouds in the sky, the voices of those airy creatures above her had a melody so sweet and soothing that a human ear would be as little able to catch the sound as her eye was capable of distinguishing their forms. They hovered around her without wings, borne by their own, light, own lightness through the air. The little mermaid at last saw that she had a body as transparent as theirs, and felt herself raised gradually from the foam of the sea for higher regions. Where are they taking me? asked she, and her words sounded just like the voices of those heavenly beings. Speak you to the daughters of air, was the answer. The mermaid had no mortal soul, and can only acquire that heavenly gift by winning the love of one of the sons of men. Her immortality depended upon union with man. Neither do the daughters of air possess immortal souls, but they can acquire them by their own good deeds. We fly to hot countries where the children of earth are sinking under sultry pestilence, uh, pestilential breezes, our fresh cooling breath revives them. We diffuse ourselves through the atmosphere. We perfume it with the delicious fragrance of flowers and thus spread delight and health over the earth. By doing good in this manner for three hundred years, we win immortality and receive a share of the eternal bliss of human beings. And thou, poor little mermaid, who following the impulse of thine own heart, hast done and suffered so much, thou art now raised to the airy world of spirits, that by performing deeds of kindness for three hundred years, thou mayst acquire an immortal soul. The little mermaid stretched out her transparent arms to the sun, and for the first time in her life, tears moistened her eyes, and now again all were awake and rejoicing in the ship. She saw the prince with his pretty bride. They had missed her. They looked sorrowfully down on the foamy waters, as if they knew she had plunged into the sea. Unseen, she kissed the bridegroom's forehead, smiled upon him, and then with the rest of the children of air, soared high above the rosy clouds, which were sailing so peacefully over the ship. After three hundred years we shall fly into the kingdom of heaven. We may arrive there even sooner, whispered one of her sisters. We fly invisibly through the dwellings of men, where there are children, and whenever we find a good child who gives pleasure to his parents and deserves their love, the good God shortens our time of probation. No child is aware that we're flitting about his room, and that whenever joy draws from us a smile, a year is struck out of our three hundred. 
but when we see a rude, naughty child, we weep bitter tears of sorrow, and every tear we shed adds a day to our time of probation. <laughs>